Hi, I'm Emma. And I'm Vivian. And today we're going to be talking about Stoopy, surpassing the scalability bottleneck of oblivious storage. And this is joint work with Giannis, Natasha, and Raluca at UC Berkeley and UC Santa Cruz. So end-to-end -end encryption provides confidentiality, which means that the attacker can't see the contents of patient records if they're stored in an encrypted form, even if we store them on an untrusted server. However, access patterns can still reveal private data. And by access patterns, I mean how the user accesses the data. So to make this a bit more concrete, I'm going to walk through a simple example with a medical disease store. So let's say there's some publicly known information about how frequently different objects are being accessed. So we know, for example, that the COVID object is accessed about 70% of the time, the flu object accessed about 20% of the time, and the asthma object accessed about 10% of the time. So the attacker is going to watch the doctor interact with the medical disease store over time uh, and see how frequently different objects are being accessed. So it can then infer the object that's accessed about 70% of the time is probably the COVID object. So now some unfortunate patient, Charlie, comes to the doctor's office and the doctor fetches object one from the medical disease store. Uh, from this, the attacker can infer that patient Charlie has COVID. So even though the contents of the records remained encrypted, the attacker could still learn private information just by watching the access patterns. So oblivious storage is a rich body of literature that aims to protect against these access pattern attacks. So now the doctor, when looking up COVID, will run an oblivious storage protocol with an oblivious disease store. And the security guarantees of oblivious storage means that the attacker cannot infer any additional information. Now, hardware enclaves have been a recent popular setup in oblivious storage. So now we have a hardware enclave that's co-located with storage in an untrusted cloud. And this lets you support multiple users because you have this trusted hardware enclave. And then you can also reduce network interaction because you no longer, your hardware enclave and your storage server are co-located in the same cloud. So the round trip is a lot shorter. Now for simplicity, we assume that these clients trust each other, but the attacker can view network communication patterns and memory access patterns inside the enclave, but not enclave contents. Now, since we target this use case, that means we have to be quite careful when we design algorithms that can run on hardware enclaves because of the leakage that we can get from these memory access patterns. So this sounds great, Vivian, but existing oblivious storage systems all have scalability bottlenecks. And by scalability bottleneck, I mean that there's a component where coordination is required for every request, and that component can't be securely distributed. Uh, many existing oblivious storage protocols are tree-based and hide the locations of objects in the tree. This leads to two common bottlenecks. So the first is location metadata, so the mapping of logical locations to physical ones, as well as the root of the tree. So all requests pass through different uh, paths on this tree, uh, and because they pass through different paths, the root becomes a single point of serialization for these requests. Uh, and this is in contrast to plain text storage systems, where we can simply shard the objects across different partitions, and the clients can access these partitions directly. Uh, here, there's no central point of coordination, like in, the, like in an oblivious storage system. Well, Emma, this leads us to the question of how do we build an oblivious object store that handles high throughput, but also scales like a plain text object store? Well, Vivian, I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> so in this talk, we'll be talking about scalable nodes for oblivious object repository, or Snoopy. So Snoopy is an oblivious object store that scales like plain text storage. So Snoopy uses hardware enclaves, and with six hardware enclaves, we're able to achieve a throughput of around 26,000 requests per second. And as we add more hardware enclaves, we're able to increase the throughput of the system. And this is in contrast to prior work like Oblati that can't scale beyond two machines and Oblix, which can't scale beyond a single hardware enclave. So how do we go about building Snoopy? If we want to emulate the scaling behavior of plain text storage systems, then let's go look at the techniques that they use and seems to work out well for them in the high throughput setting. So first we can partition our oblivious store into multiple subograms and we can shard our data across each machine. And then we can have a load balancer in the middle that collects requests from each client and then produces batches of requests for the subograms. So now our system has two components, a load balancer and subogram that run on hardware enclaves, and we should be scalable and secure, right? Well, Vivian, not so fast. So <laughs> oh no, <laughs> this is actually naively insecure because the batches sent to the subograms reveal information about the underlying request distribution. So for example, if a bunch of clients are requesting the COVID object 
and no one's requesting the asthma object, the batch to the, uh, the COVID partition is going to be much larger than the batch to the asthma partition. And this is going to leak information about the underlying request distribution. So Vivian, we need to have two goals. The first is security, so we want to hide access patterns. And if we're using batching, this means that the batch size should only depend on public information that's known to the attacker. And the second goal is scalability. So as we add load balancers or sub-ORMs to the system, we should be able to increase the overall system throughput. So in Snoopy, we contribute techniques that enable batching and partitioning with security and scalability. So how do we make the system secure? Well, first we have to handle that skewed workload you just gave. If every client requests the same COVID object, then the batch size is going to be the total number of requests that the load balancer receives. And that doesn't seem scalable because if you're sending every sub ORAM the same total number of requests you got, then wouldn't it just be better to run a single sub ORAM that could just take all the requests? Well, Vivian, that's a great point. So to handle this problem, we use deduplication. Uh, and here, the insight is that uh, if we're getting a bunch of requests for the same object, we can actually coalesce those requests at the load balancer into one single request. So for example, if a bunch of uh, clients are all writing to the COVID object, the load balancer can replace all those writes with one single write in that batch. And so that means that we can now have batches just of distinct requests. And now we can hope to maybe have batches that are smaller than the total number of requests in the system. Great, so if we just deduplicate all of our requests, run it in the Enclave, then we're good to go, right? Secure and scalable. Well, Vivian, not so fast. Remember that we're running on a hardware Enclave, so the attacker can actually observe memory access patterns. Uh, when, when you're naively deduplicating requests, it's pretty clear from the memory access patterns which requests are duplicates and which are distinct. So we contribute an oblivious algorithm that hides the relationships between different requests. Great, so now that we have a batch of distinct requests at the load balancer, we just have to figure out how to securely set the batch size B that sub ORAMs are going to receive from the load balancer. Exactly, so we have two key requirements. The first is that our batch size should be computable with public information. So this is information that the attacker knows. Um, so th this information might be the number of total requests in the system, the number of sub ORAMs, and the number of load balancers. Um, crucially, this can't be the number of distinct requests because we need to hide how many requests uh, were duplicates and how many were distinct. Uh, leaking this reveals information about the underlying request distribution. Uh, the second requirement is that the overflow probability should be negligible on our security parameter. And this is important because if we overflow, then the client has to retry their request and retrying the request leaks information about the underlying request distribution. Uh, so to solve this problem, we have, uh, we have two key insights. So the first is that in the high throughput setting, there are many concurrent requests. Uh, and we can, now we can take advantage of the fact that we've deduplicated. So we have many distinct requests that are spread across sub ORAMs somewhat evenly. Um, so now we can see that because the requests are spread across sub ORAMs somewhat evenly, we actually don't need to add many dummies to the batches in order to have a secure batch size. So you might expect that we would need to add dummies in order to have a batch size equal to the total number of requests in the system and have the overflow probability be negligible. But actually, because they're distributed somewhat equally, we don't actually need to add that many dummies. Well, Emma, this looks a lot like a balls and defense problem, and we actually contribute a bound that meets both requirements and provides scalability so that it's an efficient bound in the high throughput regime that we're targeting. So that sounds great. Are we done? Well, unfortunately, just like deduplication, we have to be quite careful about how we actually pad out these batches. So because we're running on a hardware enclave, we also have to introduce an oblivious padding algorithm so that we do not leak anything about our batch size or duplicates. So we discuss these algorithms more in detail in our paper, and we also discuss our balls into bins bound that gives us an efficient batching, um, that gives us an efficient way to set our batch, our batch size. Uh, we also in the paper discuss our sub ORM design, which we didn't have time to talk about uh, in the short version of the talk. And in our sub ORM, we take advantage of the fact that the load balancer is already doing this deduplication. So the load balancer just so the sub ORM just receives batches of distinct requests, and we're able to take advantage of the fact that these requests are distinct in order to process them in a way uh, that's optimized for throughput. We also contribute a planner, which takes as input performance requirements and outputs a system configuration. So given latency and throughput requirements, we tell you how many sub-ORAMs and load balancers you need. 
and we also prove security and linearizability of the system. So now we'll talk about Snoopy's performance. We evaluate Snoopy on 18 Azure Confidential Compute instances, which run Intel SGX, and we have an ob oblivious object store of 2 million objects and 160 bytes per object. Our baselines are Oblati, which runs on two machines, and Oblux, which runs on a single hardware enclave. So for our baselines, Oblux has a throughput of 1,200 requests per second, and Oblati has a throughput of 6,700 requests per second. Know that their throughputs stay flat because they cannot scale even when you add more resources and machines to the system. So with Snoopy, as we scale out to 18 machines, with a mean latency of 1,000 milliseconds, we reach a peak throughput of 130,000 requests per second. These blue boxes show when we add load balancers instead of sub-ARAMs when we add additional machines to our system. And these are throughput lines for other mean latencies in our system. So in conclusion, Snoopy is an oblivious object store that scales like a plain text storage. 